Hello, everyone. This is Bridget Danner, and I have with me a guest volunteer, Jamie, who is here to talk about his mold experience. I think this is my sixth uh, mold experience interview, but first one we've kind of done live. So well, first of all, welcome, Jamie. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Bridget. Happy to be here. Yeah. So you reached out to me saying that you went through quite an experience with your your young daughter and I really wanted to be able to share that because yeah, I'm sure you're not the only parent out there going through this, but you're probably in the minority in that many people with um, sick kids don't know where it's coming from. Uh, so I wonder if you could just give us a little background uh, on, you know, how what started for her and when you found mold and, and all that exciting stuff. Yeah, fun stuff. Um, <laughs> So for me, I think for most people, we kind of fell into discovering mold. Um, about four years ago, almost four years ago, my daughter started uh, losing her hair. Um, at, it started at the base of her neck. And we we're thinking, you know, maybe there's some sort of infection. Um, went through dermatologists, all the different things. Um, and within a, f a month or so after we noticed that that patch disappeared on her head, her, it, it started spreading everywhere um, mm. to the point that within eight months, she didn't have maybe eight to 10 months, she didn't have a hair on her body, her entire- Anywhere. Uh, anywhere. So she progressed from, we're not sure what this is, maybe this is an infection to, I think that she has alopecia areata. Um, and then that- Is that an autoimmune one? It is. Okay. So she was diagnosed with alopecia um, within a month or so of us noticing the, the bald spots, but then that progressed to alopecia universalis, which is um, there's no hair on the body anywhere. Um, she lost all of her eyelashes, her eyebrows, um, toe hair, basically everything on her wow. body was gone within that first year of us noticing the patch on the back of her head. Um, and she was about four years old. She was at that time. Yep. Wow. And did she have any other symptoms that you realized at the time? No. Um, you know, and we, when you're, um, presented with something like alopecia, you're told it's genetic, there isn't really a cure kind of looking to look into your family history, see if there's anything like that. And in my family history, um, we have autoimmune stuff, you know, eczema, um, shingles what, what there's a bunch of different things like that um, but there was never any alopecia and I didn't really um, know at the time even what alopecia was when it happened so uh, it was all a shock it came on really fast um, and you know we were scared and kind of did everything the dermatologist told us to do just um, and it started with doing a lot of topical treatments um, which was kind of putting on squaric acid and these different ways to almost get her body to respond to the autoimmune system that was happening in her. They were trying to give her a, her body a, almost like a distraction um, mm. to give a real response like, hey, if we put on this particular kind of acid, maybe her body will forget that it's oh. attacking uh, her hair follicles and will uh, attack the real issue of the acid on her head. Um, and we wow, I never even heard of that. Yeah. Um, and we did that for about a year and it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, to do that for, I mean, she was, she had great, she was always in great spirits, but to do that daily um, was, uh, I, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. It just, especially to put that on your kid um, every day. So, wow. Yeah. On, on side note, is there an antibody they can test for that, or they just sort of assume it's happening based on the hair loss? So I don't think there is. Um, they they do various different blood tests. I have all, I have it all written down somewhere in a folder, not in front of my face. But um, th there are tests that they can look into, but they can't really. Um, I don't think there's a, a an exact test that will say this is. Um, universalis or something like that gotcha okay and was but anybody I, else in, in your family sick um no well so that was the thing um i have different issues like i have eczema i have um you know 
chronic fatigue issues that kind of come and go, but I've had it for so long that I just thought that this is just, oh, this is just kind of what I do. Life, yeah. Life, I have, I, I'm eating foods I shouldn't, X, Y, Z. Um, to speed forward into the how I stumbled into mold, um, it was years after we stopped going to the dermatologist we couldn't really do the the topical treatments were weren't really working for us and i started doing a lot of holistic research um kind of pulled from uh, i i got recommendations of of what mold is um through different holistic people that work within alopecia they were kind of giving me tips and tricks on diets and stuff to help with alopecia in general um and from that process I ran into the book of uh, Neil Nathan's Toxic. I started getting into that realm and understanding Shoemaker and, and started looking into that because I'm just basically Googling everything because I can't sleep because my daughter doesn't have any eyebrows. So, That's um, crazy. Yeah. yeah so I, I just would spend time researching everything I could um, and pulled, started to pull from their information on the autoimmune side and, and kind of focus less on just alopecia, alopecia and more focus on autoimmune, autoimmune and what could be triggering it. Um, and through that, we just did the process of elimination. Like, what could it be is, you know, she's a kid who only wants to eat cheese and strawberries. So maybe it's a, a diet thing. Um, you know, we're all, we're vegetarian. It has to be diet. Um, but then um, once I got into Neil Nathan stuff and I started looking into it, I was like, you know, we have had leaks in our house. I wonder if the mold has something to do with it. And that started mm. down the process of, of, you know, testing incorrectly for a long time, going to Ace Hardware, buying my own little mold tests, getting air tests from a high ranked Yelp review, local company that doesn't know how to test correctly. Went through all mm. the process of doing it the wrong way. Um, to eventually being able to match through an ERMI, match the the dust in her room, the DNA of the mold in her room and the mycotoxins uh, with the um, mycotoxin test in her urine from Great Plains. And mm. we were able to kind of hyper focus on what the mold was and where it was in her room. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, I'm gonna pause you a sec because I know you wanna talk more about testing is yeah, it's so frustrating that when you start to suspect there can still be like so many false negatives and you know, it's just so frustrating. Uh, but yeah. I like a couple of things you said, said one was like, you just kept researching. And I think that's so important for chronic illness. Like I was getting emotional, like, you know, I think most people have gone through mold, you know, just kept trying and trying and trying. And, yeah. you know, there's probably, uh, you know, some people just get kind of give up. And, and, uh, but if you just kind of keep looking, you know, you are going to find the answers and, um, treatments that work for you. You know, there, of course, there's some diseases out there you can't reverse, but, uh, I just think that curiosity is just so incredibly important. Um, that was the other thing you said that, um, struck me. Oh, well, yeah. About the autoimmunity too. It's yeah, that's so true. I mean, I, I it's interesting to hear your experience, I guess, probably in Western medicine that they didn't really, it sounds like, have a sense of how autoimmunity happens, um, which in the functional medicine community, we really stress, right? Like what right. caused the autoimmunity? Right. Um, you know, I saw that when my father-in-law went through cancer too. It's like there's no even speculation on what caused it. Um so I think that was a really important step for you to just say, okay, how did her body get into an autoimmune state? So that's great. Yeah. Um, and that was frustrating for me, actually, because, you know, when we were working within um, the hospital and just trying to figure out what's happening, we kept just kind of hitting a wall that it's genetic and, you know, there's no cure. And um, maybe that's true I, I think a lot of that is potentially true but we weren't really given a lot to build upon you know as it was more just like take children's allegra and squaric acid and then here are new medicines coming out later that they're practicing and on uh, none of that sat well especially with a four-year-old um yeah so tender so it was the allegra for histamine 
Kind yeah. Of, okay. So, so I felt like there was looking back, I, I feel like there's a, they under, there's an understanding of what this was doing to her body enough, like internally that they were even looking into histamines and different yeah. things like that. But I don't, it's, it, it's frustrating. I don't, I, I don't really have the answers for it, but it was, it got to a point that um, we had to kind of make a clean break and say, okay, this is something that we just need to go on our own journey for. And I almost feel like because it was through my daughter and she's this adorable little package of a human being that it drove me to be more focused that if it was me, I probably would let it go for longer. You know, like if it was, if I had chronic fatigue or different things, I'm like, ah, oh, it's fine. You'll power through it. But when it became um, my daughter affected by it, everything goes. <laughs> so good for you. Yeah. Sometimes I bring that up when I, I need to get a little bit tough love because it, it can be hard to make these decisions for yourself, especially your own mold. It gets so expensive. It's like, yeah, you, you saw your own child suffering like this. Would you stay in the house? Would you, you know, would you make these same choices? Yep. Um, so you're an example. Uh, of that. So you're, you're in the Bay Area. I, I think you're the first Californian this, this week or the last couple of weeks of talking to you with mold. Wow. <laughs> so it's definitely there. Um, it can be anywhere, but I think you've got that, you know, that coastal climate. Um, tell us, yeah, tell us more about your experience with your house and the false alarms with testing, that kind of thing. Yeah. So um, I did everything wrong first. Um we did a bunch of air tests and we actually found some visible mold uh, that was happening in the in our basement. Um, and that's due to poor drainage of the house and things like that. Um, and, you know, I didn't even know what remediation was. So we started with reme a remediation company, removed the visible mold. We took a clean, air, like an um, a air test afterwards for like a clean bill of health. And I didn't know what ERMI was at the point. So I was just, I kept doing things incorrectly and kind of stumbling forward. Um, so you removed some things in the basement, tested air and thought it was okay? That we were done. But then gotcha. there was, we took an air sample in her room initially and there was one um, spore of Stetcher borealis found in her room um, through an air sample. And I learned later that that's kind of a heavy mycotoxin that's kind of sticky. Yeah. Um, so if you find one, chances are that there is a lot more happening potentially. Um, so it didn't make sense that I saw the visible mold and then there was an air sample in her room that tested positive on the other side of the house. And I just couldn't, I just kept thinking about where else could it be? Um, and luckily uh, I had, I started working with a functional medicine doctor being like, okay, this is mold. I, I need to, I, I'm overwhelmed immediately about you know, what binders to do. I don't know what this means. Um, my daughter's never taken a vitamin before. So I have to like teach her how to take vitamins. Don't like pills, no. <laughs> yeah, so I had to like go through a process of giving her frozen blueberries to like practice how to take pills and then get ready oh, for- Oh, that's a great idea. Huh. Yeah, it was, it was a process and we practiced for like a week or so. And then we're like, okay, now here's a probiotic. And I had to, I was taking all the small capsules and I'm digging out and put like, I bought- Amazon on small, like a bunch of small mini capsules. And I would open up the vitamins and fill in the mini capsules from the big ones. And that's it, a good it was, idea too. It, I, I don't recommend that at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay. never mind. Yeah. Mostly you want to put them in applesauce or something. Did you move to that? Yeah. She's, um, she's a sensitive eater. She, she, oh, she, didn't she won't want to do that either. Oh, okay. Um, okay. so it was a process, but then we started working with a functional medicine doctor that worked with children, um, which can also kind of be kind of tricky to find. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I actually got a recommendation for this, this doctor because I reached out to Neil Nathan's website directly and I said, Hey, I would love, I, I see you have a, a, a list of curated doctors. Do you know any ones that work with children? And I, I went back and forth with his wife, I think for a while, just trying to help navigate through that. Um, and I think that was one of my biggest tricks too. I just started asking questions to everybody, <laughs> anyone that had something to say or an interesting blog or something that was sparked my interest. I emailed them and I said, what is this about? Um, so a lot of conversations, a lot of back and forth with people. And eventually um, I, I got an inspection in the house 
And this inspector went through the whole house and didn't do any armies, um, did a visible mold tests. I did it wrong again. <laughs> and he gave me a gem though. And he said that the, the remediation company that comes makes sure that they have a CMRS um, stamp of approval, which is some element of, uh, I, I forgot the exact phrase of that, but it's, it's like, um, it's a level of understanding toxicities and how it affects the body. Um, and I started looking up those companies <laughs> and asking questions to those people who are local. Uh, and through that process of, uh, this is over a year or so of this since discovering mold, um, I was able to work with um, companies to, to help me understand our crawl space and how our crawl space can have a big effect on our health. Um, mm -hmm how to test in her room, uh, what, how to test in our attic, um, using ERMI tests to understand this stuff. So it was, it was kind of this whole higgledy piggledy piece together process to, to finally understand like, okay, why is this happening to her though? Why is it happening in her room? Um, and through the process of elimination, um, we found that it was the windowsill that was outside of her, of her room that was rotted through. Mm. Um, and after all these tests, I only really found that out because I started sanding it down because it looked like it was, it needed a new paint job. And it just started, pull, it was like pulled pork. Mm. <laughs> well, out of all the inspections, I think I went through two different inspections, army tests. And the thing that really did it was just looking at, looking at it, the, um, her windowsill and pulling at it. And, and it just disintegrating in my hands and us being like, that's where it is. And that was the outside windowsill. That was the outside, but it went into the, it went to the inside too. Yeah. So, that's mostly um, where our mold was. And I don't think people realize like, I, I'm sorry, it was very similar, like a teeny tiny bit of visible in the basement, some leakage issues, yeah. but a lot more like windows installed cor incorrectly, things like that were more of our downfall because it was in the in the walls. Our, our inspector did do, um, did you have an inspector use those moisture readers to say, oh, there's moisture in your wall? We did. So, um, and that was actually, I had him check her window specifically because I was for some reason suspicious. I was like, this always kind of looked funky on the outside just because it's an older window. Um, and there was no moisture. It was completely dry. Um, and we kind of relied on the moisture reader instead mm. of um, potentially like doing some swab tests for for dust or different things like that for mycotoxin so it was dry and, he, and we kept moving um but once we found her window was an issue um we stopped we had a remediation company come out um replace the window and it was a it was like a switch after that for her it was crazy wow. uh, her hair we were starting to see a little bit of um, eyelashes and stuff grow back from the probiotics and some of the diet restrictions that we we're trying to do to help her belly. But the moment that we replaced her window, it just started coming up in patches. Um, every five days or so, there would be a new little like patch the size of a dime that would show up randomly on one part of her head. And then an, one eyebrow would show up. <laughs> the wow. other one would follow for four months. But then there was like, it was just this weird, it was almost like, it was kind of like the, the process of understanding what was going on with her body or how random that was. Her hair grew back just as random. It was like these different patches and then they would connect and um, <laughs> it was amazing it's to watch. It's definitely like one of the most impressive stories I've heard, Jamie. <laughs> it was, ama it was amazing. Crazy. Every little follicle because um, uh, alopecia universalis is or like when you have alopecia it's not like it's you're the it's almost like the follicles are gone it's like completely smooth and it it's you can it's just a different kind of feeling it's almost like her head was so bald that it almost felt like rubbery when you would rub it mm. um, so to have these little patches show up and then this kind of field of hair buds just start popping up everywhere um 
was amazing. And every five, five days or so, there'd be like a new growth. And we were just like celebrating the whole time. And just like, I bet very skeptical because you're trained early on that there's like alopecia is random. It can come and go and maybe it'll mm-hmm. come, maybe it'll go, maybe it won't. Um, so we've always like, we've held our breath, but then as we were understanding what was happening, we felt less, it didn't feel as random because first of all, we were able to match the DNA of what was in her urine to what was in her room. And the moment that we removed the window and the source of where she was sleeping next to for the last four years, um, it was her body responded so incredibly that it just made us go, I, I feel like we just, we got so lucky. Like we found her source in a way. Um, and at this level, it's it just, you know, it's been about a year and a half since that happened. Um, and she still has a couple like thin spots, but it's, her hair is completely grown back. Um, I want to ask you a couple of questions based on that section, which one is like, what inspired you to keep looking for mold in the house? Like, did you just have a feeling or, you know, what, what was it? Uh, intuition. And yeah. um, I kind of looked at, I, I tried to, I, I used, I spent the last few months just writing down my thoughts, like what happened just to try to process all this stuff. Um, and it was almost like that 3 a.m. ceiling, you know, like when you wake up and you're just like your body wakes you up and like something's like something's not right. Um, that's that can't be it. You know, um, it almost became like a game that my mind was on to be like, is that really do you feel like that's it? Like, did we find it for her? And I just kept digging and kept thinking about it. Um, and the more I studied, um the more I realize, I'm like, I'm not doing this right. I have to look, I have to look deeper. I have to, I have to think about this more. Um, and to be honest with you, I wanted to be done. The moment that we were placed downstairs in the basement, I was like, that's it. We're done. Um, but it didn't sit right. And then mm-hmm. after the inspection, I was like, okay, we did the inspection. That should be it. We've done enough, but it didn't sit right. Like there was something that was not correct. It just didn't, and it's maddening <laughs> to be honest with you and to try to explain that to people like oh we're going to do more because it's not we didn't do it right the first time or it's not sitting right and something's missing um to keep pursuing that was uh was a was a process yeah sure. yeah you know one thing i've learned from interviewing more and more and more mold inspectors lately is like usually there are several areas of the house that have been affected. It's Mm -hmm. not just one area. And when I thought back to my own house, I'm like, oh yeah, that was us too. So, you know, the chances you're in an older home and a wet area and there's only been one incident, um, probably a pretty rare, especially if someone's sick in the home. So you always have to kind of pair that. My other question for you was you, you got the window replaced. I'm curious about her belongings and what you, what you did in the room. Yeah. So, um, we replaced her bed, um, and we replaced her pillows and her blankets, but, um, a lot of the stuffies that we had in there, we didn't replace. Um, just because it almost felt overwhelming. We were doing so much at the same time that to be like, and now I'm going to throw your stuffies away. Like it just felt like too much. It's, it's dealing with someone that's that little and her just powering through all this, um, the diet changes, like, like you can't eat cheese and weed anymore. (laughs) Uh, we're only going to have you know, you, here's tapioca starch that you're going to have to learn how to like, like all these different diet changes that we're doing for a little, a little girl. Um, it was very important for us to make her not feel different in a way, like make her just be like, okay, like we're listening to you. If something is too much, you have to tell us and then we'll Mm, go down. Um, there was breaks that we would do in vitamins and different things like that. So when it came to the stuffies, it was kind of like there was a, a line drawn. And I respect. <laughs> did did you wash them or treat them in any way? Yeah, we washed them. Um, we washed them um, and and vacuum and HEPA we HEPA vacuumed them and then washed them. Um, but there's probably things that we haven't done correctly on that. You know, I, I feel like we're still we're still learning um, of what to how how to change our our world and life to be a little bit 
more friendly, especially because he's this sensitive. But um, we kept a lot of the books and the stuffies, but we did replace her bed um, and we did replace the bedding and stuff. You know, I might speak to her age, too, that she was able to tolerate that, you know, even though she went through so much, there's still some resilience at yeah. that age. Um, I remember speaking of stuffies, like I remember like the you're so funny with your kids, like it's, a, you know, we were cleaning at our house and same thing, like we were, I think we were trying to decide to do with like a stuffed animal that was had been my husband's and then he gave him to my son. And I remember our son just like looking up at us like are you serious? Like you're going to get rid of that? And it was just like, yeah, they had, those are like their little babies. And I don't even really, I think we just said, we're going to put it in storage for the summer. We, we went away for the summer. I think we, you know, he probably kind of forgot about that, but there were some hard things. And, you know, he, he really had a struggle with uh, moving too, which we ended up moving, you know, out of state. And yeah. I think it was for the best, but it, it's tough when you see your little ones, you know, be affected by this thing that completely wasn't their fault. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, yeah. And okay. Describing, describing why that's the case is is hard for them. Yeah, no, they don't have any frame of reference. None about nobody else is going through that that yeah. they know. So I, I wanted to circle back too to you talked about intuition, but you also did a lot of research and a lot of questioning. And I think that's something I say in my my mold book, which is probably not something a lot of practitioners say. But since I went through it myself, I, I feel like there's these threads that you find and you're like, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah. And you don't have to follow every thread like that will make you crazy. But if there's somebody who really speaks to you or something that doesn't sit right, like you said, um, yeah, listen to that. Like stay grounded in that intuition and the possibility. It's it's tough because when you're in a lot of, um, you know, when you're in fight or flight, your brain doesn't want to see possibilities um, right. or stay grounded. <laughs> it's just, but I think what you do, what you've done is a great example of like the combination. I mean, you, you didn't just like, well, didn't just like download from heaven as like a possibility. You actually studied, but then you're like, yeah, this sounds, this sounds like it. I don't think we figured it out in the house. Um, yeah. And it, it, it makes you, I hate that spin of like the, the repeating the stuff in the home and like, you know, making mistakes. And I think everybody has made different types of mistakes. And yeah, it's so defeating. And you're like, oh, I thought we were done with this. And now here yeah. we go again. <laughs> it's, it, and it's crazy that it's almost like the consensus is to do it wrong initially. <laughs> like it, when, I, yeah. when I was working with, um, we actually just did a whole new suite with the house um, just recently. Uh, even though my daughter's been recovering, I have been still slower to recover on my own fatigue mm. issues, things like that. Um, and it's when when you look into this, it's kind of like even with working with pe like a scientist or not scientist, but the people who can actually study and 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 sample your house correctly, they usually tell me that we're the third or fourth inspector. That um, most of the clients say, you know, you're they all say that they tested wrong initially. They all like, um, basically you have to like try it and try different things to figure out how to do it correctly. And I found that I was stumbling left and right uh, to really pull it together. And when I try to describe that story to um, some of the remediation companies that I work with or um, some of the indoor um air specialists, um, environmental professionals, the IEP people, um, they're like, oh yeah, that happens all the time. People do it wrong initially and then they eventually find yeah. us. I'm like, why is that the case? Like, why do we have to? I just think there isn't a lot of like information and education. And yeah, I mean, that's partly why I wrote my book to include some home yep. stuff, even though I'm not the biggest expert, but you know, we lost two cars making mistakes about remediation. Like, mm. so I've, I made all the mistakes and, you know, heard enough that I was like, well, at least I want to get people on the right path. So when people message me and ask me an offhand question, I'm like, you know, I can try to help you, but really like you need to educate yourself before you get into this process because, yeah. 
you know, you're going to make mistakes. Otherwise, you still may, but I'd like to save people, you know, some of the mistakes. And I think these things do happen that you don't always hire the right person on the first try. It's nobody's fault. You know, hopefully the quality of that will come up over time. We were lucky that our first inspector was good. Mm. Um, but our our remediation was very <laughs> flawed, um, which was more on us. Like we didn't understand, um, you know, our remediator said, move everything out of the basement into the main floor so I can work on it. All that stuff was contaminated. And, yeah. and now it was in our <laughs> living space. <laughs> like that now to me, I laugh because like, I'm like, God, that's so obvious. But I just didn't know that was a thing. Um, yeah, I feel like it's part of the process of, of you know, failing till you get it right. I just wish it didn't have to be that way. I wish there was more of an agreement amongst even people who, you know, test for mold that they can all agree that like you can't just visibly looking for mold in your house is not you're not going to find it. You're not like no, it's not. And if you do, that's not going to be the root of it. Or, you know, I don't know. There's just a, there's a disconnect. But um, we actually just went through another sweep because um, we were cleaning out our decks um, on the outside and I got hit with uh, crazy chronic fatigue from just cleaning mm -hmm. out the decks. Um, and my wife got some element of vertigo from doing it too. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that is a red flag. <laughs> and I'm not trying to save anything for a chance because my daughter, my own eczema and chronic issues. And we went down through the bottom part of the house that I'm, I'm in right now and found um, definitely some more problem areas. So we're, we're getting ready to do another sweep of this mm. whole thing. Yeah, when we redid our house, we ended up um, redoing a lot of decking because it was all mm. like kind of attached to the house and rotten mm. and we were doing the siding anyway. So yeah, I think just to, for people to know there's multiple sources. And just recently I've interviewed two um, different inspectors here and you can find them on, on the YouTube channel. So if you're just like, if this is bringing up questions for you, we do have, you know, resources for that. Um, right. And I, yeah, I want to get some more info for you, but I just want to say, yeah, I appreciate you sharing because this is, this is how people learn. And, you know, I think one thing I'm hoping is happening too, as we educate people is just, they learn to be better homeowners, you know, more aware of what can go wrong. Um, there's so much like education, like that I didn't even know I needed to have as a homeowner. So I think that's right. one important thing these conversations are bringing up. Yeah. And there's a, there's a level that I, I felt that I was kind of running against resistance systematically. Um, when I brought up this kind of stuff to um, my daughter's um, my daughter's doctors and the dermatologists about like, hey, I think that mold is a, it could be a problem and we wanted to get these certain tests. Um, we basically were just quoted that it's pseudoscience. Oh, wow. And I was like, that's not a professional email. <laughs> um, but we, you know, it just was one of those things like, okay, that was kind of a harsh response to us just trying to get some urine tests. Um, but that made me go, why is that the case? Um, and then working with different construction workers of how they're like, mold is not a problem. It's everywhere. Like, okay. Like, why was there this level of like a systematic response that was kind of re re resisting what we were finding? Um, and that was fascinating to me. That still kind of blows my mind. It makes me want to get more involved to try to get more information out there. And that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you because I appreciate your work. Um, and I just was like this, there's just so many stories like mine that are not getting the light of day. Um, and many families that are out there that are confused about alopecia or different autoimmune issues, then they don't even think to look at this stuff. Um, no. And I think it's really important. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I want to do a sample test of, I wonder if every single child with alopecia took a, a mycotoxin test, how many would we find with a mycotoxin issue? Like, I feel like there's things that need to be done to, to elevate this conversation because I feel like it's, for lack of better terms, being swept under the rug. Um, and that's just where the dusty mycotoxins are. <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah, I just put in the chat. You may want to even kind of get involved, Jamie. Uh, if if it calls you, is this some friends of mine have started this foundation uh, that's gonna just it's brand new, but it's a nonprofit for like mold education and financial support and research. So it's nice to see these things are emerging. Yeah. Um, you know, when I first was sick. I think there was some stuff already written and Dave Asprey had just put out his moldy video, which I really credit him for being really like, you know, ahead of things to, he put a lot of money into that video. And, yeah, um, but even just since then, which now it's been for me, I don't know, like seven years or so, like there's a lot emerging, you know, like there's three mold podcasts I can think of offhand and yep. I think more coming, um, and it's such an impactful thing on your life as, you, as you've experienced that I think it does often call people to be an advocate. Um, so I was already in the field of the medicine, so it's kind of an easy switch or calling for me. But we had one client who um, was on this series who started doing like crisis call work. And uh, we have a client who's a, like a veterinarian who's going to move into holistic veterinarian work. So it's That's cool great. to see, yeah, what can come out of it. So I would just encourage people if you're watching and you're you're going through it, um, you know, heal yourself first. That takes time, as Jamie's sharing, but um, you can get on the other side, and you may really feel some calling to to get involved or educate. And I think the more the the better. It's a huge topic. Yeah, and I think that it's with um the weather changes and climate changes and stuff i feel like this is going to grow um and uh everything has an expiration date even new windows and walls and a lot of times they're not stamped and you don't know when it's going to expire um but you know this is something that i feel like is education that needs to be brought about i mean my my daughter's window probably was you know our home is 100 years old so that window <laughs> it's kind of scary to think about at least the frame of it you know the window like maybe the glass is not but the window frame probably is you know so um it's it's crazy but i do think for us um it just was it was interesting that we were consistently told that it's genetic and there's no cure um for her case but alopecia is genetic um, and you can't cure genetics. We weren't trying to cure her genetics. We were trying to remove what her genetic response was responding to. We were trying yeah, to her epigenetics, to, yeah. Her genetically responding to um, a leaky gut or auto, autoimmune issue. And um, that's what we were trying to solve, not genetics. So it's, it was almost like this, this, uh, this phrase that we kept that we were consistently told it's not even an argument because how do you what do you, how how do you cure genetics like we're we're trying to we're trying to remove what she's responding to that it's was kind of throwing in the towel yeah yeah it felt, yeah. It, it felt like that and I, and i got frustrated as a as a dad just being like i'm not i don't want to work with people who throw in the towel like it's just exactly yeah it's not gonna happen yeah, you know, it's funny. We did a, our binders webinar yesterday and a woman on the call was having hair loss in the back, even like you said, how your daughter's mm -hmm. and and she thought it was like her thyroid medication mm -hmm. change. And so you've just you've really taught me something, too, because even though I say a oh, mold can create any symptom, which I think is true, mm -hmm. you know, it's more powerful for me once I've actually like had a, an experience with it um and you're yeah. really my first like super clear experience with it. it's amazing that that was like her main symptom although she did have these food sensitivities or particularities i know a lot of kids are like that um, mm -hmm. but a lot of mold clients are very particular about what they can eat as well so i wanted to hear if you uh, had any kind of healing tips that were like really game changing for you and your family yeah. Um, so one of the biggest ones was my wife is an amazing cook and she likes, she loves to cook and she was able to take all these kind of AIP recipes. Cause when we first started this healing, we were like, okay, AIP autoimmune protocol diet. Um, we were pulling from this information, like, what is this about? Um, we're not, she's a four-year-old. We're not just going to say no more 
of your favorite treats, but what can we limit it down to? And we found some amazing recipes of making pancakes and waffles and fun little kid, kid food that tasted great um, from these recipes and learning how to cook that way, learning how to cook in a sensitive way that removes wheat and, um, and any kind of like over lectin -y, um, issue that could be hurting your belly. That was big for us because it would buy us time. We were able to essentially say, Hey, look, you can still have maple syrup and all these different foods that you love so much. And it's, it's, if we found a way to make it livable and that would give us enough time to be like, okay, now let's, let's take this time to research to figure out what's happening. Cause I felt like I was always against the clock. Um, cause she would run out of patience. Mm. <laughs> all the time. So we were trying to figure out ways to make it tasty and fun. Um, for her, it was like, she could get any hat that she wanted. We can, we can make dark chocolate brownies and all these different things just to make it like kind of celebrate along the way. Um, because it can get very serious. It can get very rabbit holeish. It can be all consuming. So trying oh, to find yeah. a way to make it livable while, you know, find your treats, find your things that won't hurt your body while you're doing this, um, was big for us. Um, and you started that diet before her window got found out. Correct? Yeah. We started, okay. we started diet before mold. Um, before we understood any of that stuff, that was our first, our first step into this was through diet. Um, and we also found that after we removed the mold, she became a lot less sensitive to most things. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so true. Yeah. I, I think that was one of my big ahas doing the mold summit is kind of realizing this commonality of the multiple food sensitivities. And, you know, mostly we're talking adults, um, it's, it's kind of the same thing. We're just like voicing it differently. You know, she might have said, I only want to eat this or this, but so many adults are like, I can't eat these 20 things, you know, and that's how I live. And it's not really supposed to be, you know, how our gut works. So it, it, it sounds like you're both an advocate of, of a certain diet, but also she had to get that mold removed for things to really click for her. Exactly. And, um, we still try to limit a lot of the, the the wheat and dairy and different things that we know she was sensitive to. Um, but we're at a level now that she can go out and have cupcakes and pizza with her friends. And it's not a problem because that's not, that wasn't her source. You know, I mean, we're not going to eat that yeah. every day, but right. I think for us, we were trying to figure out a way to feel livable. Like this is, you have to, you have to still be able to go outside and you still have to be able to go meet with friends and not worry about every little, little piece. Um, take more time trying to figure out what the root was, less time about yeah. all of, um, the other stuff that might not even really make that big of a difference. Um, so that was, that was big for us. We were trying to figure out the level, like making it livable for a four to five year old. Um, and then we started getting into the probiotics and understanding a good, good spore probiotic and the prebiotic to help support it. Um, and we even got into a level of like for a while we we're doing like mucosa. Um, we we're kind of helping us out, and that was big for us. So that that was like as we removed the the, the mold from her window, we kind of built her belly back up with the probiotics and prebiotics and the mucosa. Um, and then now we've we've been able to strip it down to just probiotics and um, omega threes and and just kind of some basic stuff. Um, yeah, that's amazing. I'm in full agreement. You know, that's basically I have in the book. I'm like, you know, do the basics. We all need these for our organs. And then I had pre and pro prebiotic and and probiotic, which I still mostly take every day. I love prebiotics. I love the mucosal support. I think there can be so much emphasis on killing bugs, which especially for a little one is intense. So even for me, yeah. it's intense, but you can just work on building the gut with probiotics, prebiotics, mucosal products. It works amazing. Uh, and it's pretty yeah. gentle and the immunoglobulins and probiotics combine with mycotoxins and the fiber. Uh, I think that's mm -hmm. kind of needs to be like a next wave of education in this space. Um, now our binder doesn't have um, probiotics because you can't really put like charcoal and probiotics together. But I, I would like to make a second binder eventually that's really like a gut-based um, 
kind of probiotic Saccharomyces binder, but we sell all those products now anyway. But yeah, I, I think there's like a lot of power in those and they can just be easier tolerated. And then you're having, you know, the multiple benefits of like restoring the gut, um, which is restores brain health too. Uh, and also potentially binding mycotoxins um, and potentially even sweeping the gut of anything that's colonized in there. So. Yeah. And I think for us, we were, because she was so small, we were trying to be very conservative. So we weren't, we almost didn't focus a lot on binders um, yeah. initially. I think if it was just me and with me, I've done a lot more um, charcoal and, um, and clay and different things like that, that'll help. But for her, it was almost, it was glutathione um, to help um, detox a little bit. And then it was really only focusing on belly building. Because, oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think we were just, we were concerned. And a lot of that was led by um, our functional medicine doctor too. She was just like, you know, she's, let's just play conservative and see how it goes. And if, if, um, if the belly building doesn't really bring her back and we don't feel like she's getting to that level where she's recovering, then we can go deeper into binders. Mm. Um, and, but just with the belly building and adding some zinc, and stuff like that with um into the mix that was really um all her body needed like once it was once it was removed from physically from her room um she's responded really well but i i am gonna keep my eye on doing more binder work because i feel like we may have not we may not have gotten everything um so i'm, I'm watching closely but i i, yeah. I think for us at that level in her age, um, we, we went a little conservative on that. Yeah, I do think kids are, are a little hardier. I, you know, my son, I think we were super lucky. He had a huge mold colony under his floorboards and uh, wow. he stayed pretty healthy. But he did have mycotoxins in his urine. And yeah, we didn't do a lot. It's hard to get kids to do a lot. I just helped a friend who has two elderly parents with mold and I only gave them three things to do. Like I'm not going to give an 85 year old, you know, 20 new things to do. Yeah. Um, so I think if there's some, you know, if, if we know certain things are powerful, yeah, just, just try those. I think there can be a little bit overkill with like how much uh, we do and again, it gets overwhelming. So I think that's great advice. Well, Jamie, one thing I, I might ask you to do later is I'm sure people are wondering like, who did you work with? You know, what companies did you like that kind of a thing? So I might have you put it in the the YouTube uh, chat later for people. Yeah. People are always kind of like you wondering who can I see, what company was good. So that would yeah, be awesome. It. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it was, it was, it really took a village. And I feel like um, what I learned through this process too, is a lot of the people down, you know, the remediation companies down to the person who's putting on our, um, our vapor lock and our crawl spaces, all these different things that we went through. All of them were in this were in this business because they were affected, or they have a loved one that was affected by mold. And mm. I found that um, amazing and, and flooring and humbling too, because they're drawn to do this work because they know how important it is. And um, so I'm like the the village that helped my little girl recover. I'm I'm like a champion of them. So I'm, oh, uh, so I'm, great. Yeah. And is your practitioner in the Bay Area or out of town? Uh, out of town. We're all okay. Zoom Zoom calls. Zoom, yeah, yeah Zoom works. Um, awesome. Well, we'll we'll hopefully get those in in the notes for everyone. And thank you so much for you know volunteering to come on. That was just a really powerful story. And you. Uh, you know, I hope it will help some parents out there for finding their own answers. Yeah, no, I appreciate you uh, letting me um, just bombard you and say, hey, I have a story to, uh, to share. And, and no, it's perfect. You know, it's always worth it to ask because we literally had just said, like, we want to record more stories <laughs> right when you ask. So Great. so we'll keep doing this, guys. We don't have, like, a super regular schedule yet. Um, but, yeah, I recorded my first, like, five stories for the Mold Summit, and I was just like, wow, this is so much more powerful to hear people's yeah. real solutions and – you know, their own journey. I think it's so relatable um, where I'm not just preaching it, right? Like you're a real person who went through it and what worked for you. So uh, yeah, just really appreciate it. If anybody wants to reach out to me to, to share or give a suggestion, uh, I'm happy to do it. Well, thanks again, Jamie. Thanks for, thanks for watching. Bye, yeah. everybody.